turn with me to the book of Genesis. We're going to start right there, right where it all began. Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to read it, verse 11. And God said, Genesis 1 and 11, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, the fruit yielding fruit after this its kind and whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding after its own kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after this kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and morning were the third day. I, there's so much that one could pull from this scripture. Understanding what you're reading here is more than just about a tree and a plant. But what you are reading about is a new season in the Lord, a creative day. It was the second day, but now the Lord said it is the third day. Some pr pretty cool stuff happened in day one and in day two, but God says now it's day three and I'm going to do something because I'm not finished. And I want to preach this morning on the thought, God's not finished with me yet. Would you say that with me? God's not finished with me yet. When we were kids and back in my home church, the, they would have in Sunday school hour, they would have the call-up kids choir. Remember that? And they would give out a 50-cent piece to whoever was the brightest or the loudest or whatever that day. And we used to sing, He's still working on me. To make me what I ought to be. He's still working on me. But in Christendom and in churches, we think that we get saved and God stops. Unfortunately, too many people have that testimony. But God is still working on me. Let's say that again. God is still working on me. See, Another thing about God that's so amazing, he's systematic. He's process and he's order. Some of you are like, thank God he is because you're a triple OCD. And you get out of sorts when things aren't systematic. Well, you can relax today because you serve a systematic God. He follows the steps and he goes through the process. There's day one, there's day two, there's day three, and on and on it goes. And he doesn't get it mixed up. He doesn't get it all out of order, but there's a divine order and a divine decree and a declaration over every event. So with that being said, God doesn't create accidents. God doesn't do anything by chance. It's already in his orchestrated plan to bring glory and to bring honor unto his name. So God is arranging stuff. He said, let the grass bring forth seed after its kind. Let the trees yield fruit after its kind. So that God is saying, I wasn't planning on creating more trees after I created the tree. I wasn't planning on every time you needed another plant to go create another plant. But what I did was in the tree, I put the seed for another tree. In the plant, I already planned it out. That in the plant, it's going to already yield another plant. So God said, I wasn't planning on being your gardener. I wasn't planning on all of that stuff. But what I have planned is to put a system in place that it will continually begin to reproduce. So seed is the future. It means a continual. It means a system that's in place to sustain the next generations and the future generations for the work of God. And without the seed, the future collapses. Without it, we'll starve to death. 
Without the system that God has put in place, there's no way that we can get to what God wants to do next within our life. If you want a certain type of grass in your yard, you plant that kind of seed. Can everybody agree with that? You don't plant Bermuda expecting fescue to come up. You, you don't plant winter rye and, and expect um, Bermuda to come up. You plant exactly what you're expecting to come up. And if you've got a dead spot in your grass, you go and you get seed, you get fertilizer, and you water it, you nurture it, and you begin to overcome that dead spot. How many know I'm not talking about grass right now? When you get areas in your life that become dead, and you get areas in your life that, that aren't reproducing, sometimes you just got to take a step back and say, okay, God, I've got to teal because the seed is on the inside of me to produce, come on, what you've already purposed for me to reproduce. God has already created a system on the earth. And I'm wondering if God did this on day one and day two and day three in our lives, what is God ultimately saying that he wants to create in your life? But for that to happen, you've got to have the right systems in your life. Just as it were in the garden or in your yard or in your, your orchard or whatever you have that are that you that like to plant with the green thumb, you've got to have the right system in place, the right circumstances in place in order for that seed to reproduce. But if you're not going to allow the Lord to continue to work on you, then the seed will be to no effect. I could carry around in my pocket, and I, I meant to bring some, but just imagine I'm holding seed. I can talk about all the seed that I have in my hand, but if I don't ever do anything with that seed, I just got seed. I have no harvest. I have, I have nothing for it to plan forward. Matthew 12, now this is where we're going to turn this thing, and it's going to get a little deep. Put your, put, your, put your mind on. You ready? All right, here we go. We're diving in with both feet. Matthew 12, 43. And when the unclean spirit is gone out of the man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, findeth none, and he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out of. And when he is come, he findeth it is empty, swept, and garnished. Then he goeth and he taketh himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they entered in and dwell there. The last state of the man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. I got to take my time because you got to get this. The so Spirit is saying that when, when the enemy was cast out, the vessel was there. And if the vessel isn't kept, and if the vessel isn't prepared, the Spirit said, I'm going to come back. And I'm going to get seven stronger than I am, and I'm coming back to live and because I don't ever want to get kicked out again so I'm bringing reinforcements and I need to tell you today that the devil doesn't give up on you just cause you come to an altar and you pray a prayer that's why so many people get tripped up and messed up and just say, well, I thought this thing worked and I thought I got saved. And, and you did get saved. But the Bible says in verse 45 that the state of the man was worse now than it was when he began. Why? Because the enemy came in back with reinforcements. See, we are never going to be able to figure out how to be good enough. I'm sorry. You're never going to be able to figure out that if you chant Jesus enough and you, 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 if you're Catholic and you, you Holy Mary and whatever they do, that ain't going to get you there. What's going to get there is a pure heart, a clean life, and a contrite spirit. Oh, hallelujah. You've got to stay clean because the enemy, you've got, oh God, you've got God's DNA. 
You've got the creative DNA of the master down on the inside of you. The same God that created the earth in Genesis and day one and day two. He put in you the divine nature of Christ. You've got the creative power of God within you to live in his image and in his likeness. And the enemy is hoping and betting odds today that that you never get this revelation in your life. Because if long as long as you keep living your life beneath the DNA privileges that you have in God, then he can continually bring access and have access for worry and depression and bondage and fear and up and down and sinning and not. People say, well, I just can't live life without sinning. That's because you've not got the divine nature release. Listen to me now. I know this is people saying, oh, the system. When you get saved, how many know there's a definitive work of salvation? There's a definitive work of sanctification. That means God saved you. I, I've had people get saved and they walk out the service and they, they meet me in the foyer and they say, that was a cuss word, good service. The nature's not out. They sanctified. Come on. They just, they didn't think. It's just part of what their communication was. But what you need to understand is God's going to save you. He's going to take the old out. And then he's going to make you to clean your life, habits. How I many know if, if God's not cleaning you still, he's not working on you? Come on, somebody. I've been in this thing a long time, and he's still working on me. Taking out me and putting him in. It's a, and when will it stop? When you die. It's a constant dying of the flesh. But the system that God gives, he gives salvation, he gives sanctification. And then there's a defer, third definitive work. That's when you are filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. That's when the Holy Spirit, you're born of the Spirit. Come on, the Spirit, you're born. But now you begin to be baptized in the Spirit. That's when you begin to operate, come on, in the divine power that is released within your life. And when persecution comes and when you face opposition and the adversary comes, you've got something on the inside of you called power of the Holy Spirit. And the enemy, listen to me now, when you get saved, the enemy's immediately going to come. And the Bible says, while the word was sown, the thief come to steal the word. So immediately when you begin to walk with God, is this all right? Because, I mean, this is not my normal. I'm trying to help you today because some of you don't see the validity of being filled with the Holy Spirit. You don't understand why you need the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you why you need the Holy Ghost. It's, It's more than just speaking in tongues. Come on now, I'm trying to get you there. It's a power because the enemy, he's going to constantly, you understand it's this rub of flesh and spirit. And the enemy is going to constantly come against you. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Somebody lift up your hands and say, Holy Spirit, speak to us today. And it's this constant rub that, that comes against you. See, that old nature's trying to rise back up. That old man's trying to to come back in. And and listen, if you don't have something filling that void on the inside, the enemy's going to get a foothold. The enemy's going to say, ooh, look at her. Doesn't she look good? And before long, you're going to start lusting in the eye again. Come on. You're going to start lying on this and cheating on that. And It's not the big things. The Bible says the little things. And you start out little, and what the enemy does, ooh, I got my foot back in. And then he's going to say, y'all, come on, depression. Come on, sin. Come on, bondage. We got a foothold back in his life. But if you are filled with the Holy Ghost, it's like the vacuum that's filled. You can't get nothing else because I'm full of Jesus. I'm full of the power of God. And the enemy comes in with this stuff and he hits a Holy Ghost wall and he can't get access into your life. Why? Because you are filled with the Spirit. 
That's why every day, that's, I'm getting understanding. Are you hearing me? Why my daddy said, don't move far from the Holy Ghost. He wasn't talking about the emotional outbreak of Pentecost. He was talking about the power of God that's residing in your heart and in your life. And when the enemy comes in, that Holy Ghost rises up. It says, no entrance here. No access here. In hotel terms, no vacancy. It's already full up. Come on, shout, I'm getting filled today. See, God wants to recreate some new things within your life to fight off the spirits of the enemy. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. These systems work within your life. It's time that these fruition of God for the things of God, the seasons of God to come to pass within your life. That's why we pray because prayer works. You want the Holy Spirit working, you got to pray. And prayer, prayer is more than just a, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. The angels watch me through the night. Keep me in thy blessed sight. Amen. That's more, that's not prayer. That's good prayer, but that's not praying. That's a good way to go to bed, prayer. But I'm talking about getting the hold of God in prayer. Where you spend time where you're travailing and the old timer said hanging on to the horns of the altar, this daily communing with God. And when you commune with God in prayer, it's more than just deep throated stained glass. Oh God. I get so I'm like, really? That's how you're going to pray. I dare say many people in this room don't talk to God. God in heaven above, Father. You don't talk to nobody else that way. What are you doing? I talk to God like I'm talking to you right now. God, this is Tracy. I got some stuff going on. It's real. And he begins to speak back because a lot of people, they hindered from prayer because they think that's what prayer is. Prayer is communication. And so we don't know how to communicate so we don't talk to God. And I'm not saying disrespectful, but, but I'm saying communicate. If, if, it's amazing about you and your spouse. I don't know how you do, but we can, we can go all day not talk or we can go and talk three or four times a day. But anytime we get back together or talk again, it's like the last communication. We just pick it up where we left because we're in a relationship. That's what prayer is. It's a relationship with God. That's why fasting works. You're telling your flesh, flesh, be crucified because I want more of the spirit in me. You're telling your ears, ears, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the voice of God. You know what fasting, I, I'm telling you, this fast has been amazing. It's been hell on earth with some things. But other things, I've been able to hear God more clearly. Why? Because I'm getting flesh out of the way. Listen, getting more word in your life. You got to fall in love with the word of God. Come on, somebody. You want God to not be done working on you? Fall in love with his word. Never before have I seen the word like I see it. It is truly a seed within your life. And then you've got to make church a priority. I'm telling you, folks, parents, you've got to make church a priority. You have got to understand you've been given a treasure. Your children. And your children have to know the word. Listen, it's where we fellowship, it's where we have friendship, it's where we minister to one another We're in the Word, it's where we have involvement. You see, if, you main, if you're going to maintain the season that you're in, you've got to put off some old systems and allow some new systems. If you want to get out of the rut and the frustration and the life that you're in, you've got to change the way systems operate within your life. You've got to quit operating and responding in the flesh. And start responding through the Spirit. You remember years ago they, they had this big deal about a grocery cart and carrying it back to the, to the spot, WWJD, what would Jesus do? You got to get that back in your life. How would Jesus respond? What would Jesus do in this situation? Come on, somebody. 
Listen, I can stand up here today and I can talk about all the examples and all the things, how to be a better Christian, how to do this and how to do that, but the bottom line, if you're not going to allow the Holy Spirit to move in your heart and your life, I'm just preaching words. You've got to open up your spirit. It is the game changer, if you'll allow me to say it that way. Ephesians 1, 13. In whom you have also trusted after you've heard the word of the truth, the gospel of salvation, in whom you have believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I preached the whole message years ago. I'm sealed to the day of redemption. Let me tell you what God seals, the devil can't steal. And when you begin to get sealed in the Holy Ghost, when the enemy's coming in, I'm already sealed. You ever tried to get into a package that was sealed? I mean, I think they make some of them so you can't get in them. But imagine that times infinity, how God has sealed you. No matter how the enemy, no matter how many he brings with you, with him, you all any way, any any shape, you're sealed till the day of redemption. Amen. Glory, glory, glory. This is why you need the power of the Holy Ghost. Listen, God's not gonna get the season in your life mixed up. You gotta get saved. You gotta accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You got to get sanctified. Don't skip that process. You can't live like the devil and expect those, oh, God, I want the Holy Ghost. No, you got to get, got to get clean. Come on, somebody. You got to get clean. Remember the dove when it left? He came back. He's not going to land on dirt. Come on, somebody. See, it happened in, in the day of Pentecost in chapter 2 of Acts when he ascended. Come on, when he ascended, he said, you'll know I've made it back when the Holy Spirit descends. When the Holy Spirit descends, you'll know I've made it to God. When the Holy Spirit descends, it happened at an appropriate time, an appropriate season. He gave the church power. What? Power to be a witness. It was a game changer for them. They received power and dudamus in the Greek. Dudamus, the power to be overcomers and to share the good news in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth, to fill them. See, God is saying, be ye filled with the Spirit. Back in the day, I'm talking way back in the day, when they wanted furniture, God gave them a tree. There you go. Think about it. Moses, man, we need something to sit on. There's a tree. So Abraham, they, they, they made what they needed. God's given you the resources in your life to make a life. God's put it on the inside of you what you need to make a marriage. God's put on the inside of you what you need to be a father, what you need to be a mother, what you need to be a soul winner. It's there. But what you need is the power of the Holy Spirit to come and to touch you and illuminate you and empower you. Some might say, well, I don't want the Holy Ghost. I don't want a jerk, and I don't want to. That's your choice. It really is. The Holy Spirit's not going to make himself come on nobody today. I can tell you the benefits, and I can tell you all from a different standpoint and a viewpoint. All I'm saying is, God, you're still working on me. And if I knew that the Holy Spirit wanted to come over me today and change my life, I would say, come on, Holy Spirit. See, what, what this season that we're coming in, I, I need musicians come. I need, to, I need to talk and end real quick here. Listen, the season that the church is coming into, soft talk isn't going to work. Being in and out and one foot in and one foot out ain't going to work. You're going to have to know that you know that you know that you know I'm a child of God. We need to resurrect that song from years ago. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, our brothers and sisters in Nigeria have been slaughtered for the cause of the cross. 
around other nations of the world, people are being persecuted for the cause of Christ. What are you going to do when it hits our streets? Preacher, I'm expecting to get out of here, but what if we don't? You've got to have power. You've got to have something on the inside of you. It says, I stand for God. We can't waffle, church. You can't waffle and halt between two opinions. You can't say this and do that or do this and say, no, no. You've got to know that you know that you know. I'm a child of God. And he's working on me. Remember they saying, I'm not, I, I ain't what I used to be and I ain't what I'm going to be, but he's still working. I'm not in my perfected state. And let me help you. Neither are you. None of us are perfect. We've got faults. I don't want my faults on the screen today. I'm embarrassed by them. So are you. But I'm man enough to admit I need the Holy Ghost. I need the Spirit of Christ working within me. I need God to do, listen to me, young people. You have been so misled by the church on the power of the Holy Spirit that it's, it's just some kind of exercise or emotional. That may happen, it may not. I, I, that's really irrelevant. But what happens is, is the manifestation. But what about the tongue stuff? Tongues, the Bible says, is the evidence. It's not the end all. It's just the evidence. He's there. And what is he there for? To change the systems. To tell the devil, no entrance. Can I just, I know this sounds, and I'm about to do something that's going to be really strange for some of you. Can I get an usher to stand one at each one of those exits, doors? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I need eight ushers. Just put your hand on the door. So preacher, what are you doing? I'm symbolically trying to tell you how I want to see your life. How God wants to see your life. Now, guys, I'm not going to say it. You just say it real loud now. There's no room in here. Okay. Come on, guys. Let's hear the ushers. Tell them. Tell them. Oh, come on, ushers. Tell, tell the devil. Tell him. There's no room in here. Tell him. Let me hear you, Stuart. What about it, Rick? What about it, Brian? Oh, I can't hear you, Brian. I hear you. What about it? Ray Ray. What about it? I'm telling the devil, there's no room in this church. We're sealed. There's no entrance in here. We've got the power of the Holy Ghost. See, the devil's trying to come back with seven more. But I'm telling the devil, there's no room here. You know, we set an usher at each door. Just imagine the Lord sending the ministering spirits of God, the angels, round about your life, charged with the power of God, telling the devil, you can't touch their life. You can't have their mind. You can't have their health. You can't get their finances. You can't have them. There's no room here, devil. Stand with me very quickly. But you got to be full of the Holy Ghost. You got to be full of the Holy Spirit. 
Some of you need to get saved this morning. Some of you need the salvation power of God in your life. You need God to save you. How do I do that, Pastor? It's real simple. The Bible says, by faith, confess your sins. He is faithful and he is just to forgive you. Doesn't matter where you've been. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter who you are in society. He says, I'll forgive you. I'll wash you. Would you just say that, Lord, forgive me of all of my sins. I receive you by faith as my Lord and Savior. You know the good thing about that? If you meant it, he did it. There's no magic. There's no magic in that. It's faith. That's freely gives. Then the Lord, he wants to sanctify you. You say, well, I don't do as much as I used to. No. God sanctified me. And it's not, I get there's a definitive work of sanctification. How many know God will sanctify you, but then he's going to continue to work on you? It's not just this, because how many know you, there's stuff about it, about you that you didn't know you had till he worked on you? I didn't know I had that. I didn't know I still harbored that feeling. I didn't know I still, but the Holy Spirit. Just come on, Lord, sanctify me today. Sanctify my mind, my actions, my deeds. Sanctify me, Lord. And then this is where many people just get so weirded out about church. I mean, we've got denominations that split over it and people get all crazy fill me Lord with the Holy Ghost you're born of the Spirit because you've just prayed he's working on you through the sanctification but Lord I need the power of God I need the Holy Spirit so he's a comforter he's a guide Lord fill me today with the Holy Ghost how do I know I got it? You'll speak in tongues. That's the evidence he's there. It's not the end all, it's just the entrance. You'll know he's, you, he's arrived. Whew. Why? Why do I want it? Because we want to tell the devil, there's no room here. There's no room here. He's working on me. Systems are going to change. Because it's a new season. Some of you have been filled with the Holy Ghost for years, but you need a refreshing. Because the door is getting flimsy. You're getting a little waffling in your decisions. You need a re-strengthening of the Holy Ghost. You need a re-empowering of the Holy Spirit. See, when he shows up, it's beyond anything you can do. Pastor, I'm hungry. I want to be filled with the Spirit. I want to leave this place knowing he's working me. Pastor, I'm on a, I want to join you today in my quest. Some of you may not even understand totality of what I'm trying to explain to you, but you feel something stirring. That's the Holy Spirit. 
Pastor, I want to be filled with the Spirit. I want you to get out of where you're standing. Whether you've been filled before many times or whatever, but you need, you need God today. You want the Holy Spirit in your family. You want Him in your life. You want Him in your marriage. You want Him over your business. You want Him in every aspect. I'm standing today in this altar as a pastor of this church declaring, Lord, we want the Holy Spirit.